I would. Welcome to our post-lunch session um, on ecology, economy, and ethics. We're going to speak about how we can transform our society's legal, economic, and cultural systems um, in order to achieve the kind of value system, as Betty Lyons put it uh, over lunch, um, that really takes into account the most precious and sacred elements of, of our lives. And that's a big challenge right now. We're very honored um, to have this uh, panel gathered here. And um, especially honored to have Chief Oren Lyons. And I want to begin by saying he just asked me not to read his full uh, biography and list of accomplishments. So I'm going to do my best to summarize. Um, but I, I want to begin by saying that uh, I, I'm, I'm very fortunate to be able to run this small center here, Center for Earth Ethics, and I've just been able to convene a class which I'm facilitating, and the very first assignment that we had in this class was to read um, some essays by Oren Lyons, um, an op-ed that he wrote on the doctrine of discovery, an essay uh, called Listening to Natural Law, and this book, A Basic Call to Consciousness from the 1970s, talking about how we need to change our relationship um, to Mother Earth and honor and care for her. Oren Lyons is a traditional faith keeper of the Turtle Clan and a member of the Onondaga Nation Council of Chiefs of the Six Nations of the Iroquois Confederacy. He's also professor of American Studies at the State University of New York at Buffalo, where he directs the Native American Studies program. He was born in 1930 and raised in the traditional lifeways of the Iroquois on the Seneca and Onondaga reservations in northern New York State. After serving in the Army, he graduated in 1958 from the Syracuse University College of Fine Arts. He then pursued a career in commercial art in New York City, becoming the art and planning director of Norcross Greeting Cards with 200 artists under his supervision. He has exhibited his own paintings widely and is noted as an American Indian artist. Since his return to Onondaga in 1970, Chief Lyons has been a leading adv advocate for American Indian causes. He is recognized not only in the United States and Canada, but internationally as an eloquent and respected spokesperson on behalf of natives, Native peoples. He's a sought after lecturer or participant in forums in a variety of areas. And for 14 years, he has taken part in the meetings in Geneva of Indigenous Peoples of the Human Rights Commission of the United Nations and helped to establish the Working Group on Indigenous Populations in 1982. He serves on the Executive Committee of the Global Forum of Spiritual and Parliamentary Leaders on Human Survival and is a principal figure in the traditional circle of Indian elders. It's hard to summarize because it's so interesting <laughs> and impressive. Um, but to go to a very important point, Chief Lyons is a lifelong lacrosse player. And <laughs> not, only, not only a wonderful um, representative and spokesperson for this beautiful sport, which I also love and love to play, um, he's also really good at it. He was all American in this sport, uh, which was, of course, invented by the Iroquois. And he's currently honorary chairman of the Iroquois Nationals lacrosse team. We're so honored to have you here today, and thank you so much for coming forward and bringing us your words. Thank you. 
Namaskano. Thank you for being well. That's our greeting. And your answer is Kosha Dogus. Kosha Dogus. Yes, that's true. It's always about health. I've been uh, struggling these past few hours, um, wondering how I'm going to um, coordinate and work with these experienced gentlemen here uh, and all of their uh, abilities and all of their experience. One thing I've learned, you know, after all these years is experience counts. It's the best teacher. <clears throat> I had a, I have a son and I called him Rex the hard way. It's just the only way he learned was the hard way. <laughs> and so uh, that's been kind of my teacher as well. So I've been fortunate to go through all this uh, experiences and so forth. But today, uh, my emphasis and my concentration has been on global warming because of the seriousness of it. Uh, it trumps nations, it trumps treaties, it trumps everything. It's survival. And um, I've had really the honor, long experience with good friend Al here. Many years, you know, I, um, the Global Forum of Spiritual and Parliamentary Leaders, I think that's where we first met in Russia. That was a good meeting. That was a really good meeting. And, um, you know, it's, it's not news. Everything that we talk about is not new. It's been said again and again. The, uh, the question is, uh, how do we get people to listen? Or how do we, how do we um, get a change? And so um, value change for survival. That was, um, we were in Tokyo. 91, and um, Akio Matsumura, who was the, who was the executive director of, of the Global Forum at that time, uh, and Kuzumita Peterson, I think she's here somewhere, uh, <clears throat> was kind of like his executive secretary. Anyway, I asked him a question. I said, we've been meeting over these past four years, and so uh, can we get a conclusion? Can we come to some kind of a conclusion. And so, oh, there's Kuzumita, I just came in. And uh, <clears throat> he said, okay, good question. So, so he asked the forum, there was 250 international leaders, very, very high quality and very dedicated. And we got an answer, and it was four words. To all those meetings, four words. Value change for survival. If you don't change your values, you're not going to survive. So what are the values then? That's the next question. You know, and the values that, uh, that we're familiar with, I'm talking now about the Haudenosaunee, our leadership, the Iroquois. But first of all is the responsibility to the future. I'm sure by this time you've all heard the word seven generations. That's an instruction that comes to our leaders when we are put up for leadership. The instructions are when you sit in your council for the welfare of the people, think not of yourself, nor your family, nor even your generation. Make your decisions on behalf of those generations coming those faces looking up from the earth, each generation, unto seven. That's a long term. In those days, they're talking a full lifetime as a, a human being for a generation, not the 20-year shortcut, 80 years, times seven, looking out for those faces, having a compassion for those faces having a responsibility for those faces. Our children, 
our grandchildren, great-grandchildren. Leadership, principle, values. Not complicated, pretty hard today's times. So over these period of years and all of our, you know, these, these men here and uh, the young lady sitting at the end picked up your dad's work. It's always good when your kids pick up your work. You know, usually they're angry because you're always gone. But after a while, they understand, pick up the work. And so as we have gone through our courses of our lives and, and um, tried our best to promote those values and bring that change, it seems to be that <clears throat> we can't seem to make headway. We can't seem to make a dent into the powers that be today. Our leadership, our governments are compromised by corporate power, the values of money, dollars, dollars and cents, Trump's common sense. Common sense prevails in the end, you know. I don't care how many dollars you have. So how do we, how do we change that direction? How do we, how do we do this? And so the, this type of seminar, this type of meeting is important because the people sitting here, yourselves, you know you're all leaders. You're all leaders and you have to get back out there and you have to carry on and do, coming in and get a breath and get a fresh air and get, get some, uh, you know, looking at the coaches. Okay, coach, that's what we do next. Uh, <clears throat> that's where we are. And uh, in spite of the history of the native people in this country, which is a uh, really horrendous history that you've never been told. You don't know our history. You don't know your own history. You've never been told. You don't know that the Haudenosaunee, our Iroquois leaders, were sitting with your founding fathers instructing them on democracy, instructing them on the importance of, of working with your partner, the women, the men and the women, they work together. That's where your strength is. You know, when the beginning of, of your nation, our leaders were talking with your um, Continental Congress at that time, 1775. And they said uh, to us, they said, we're planting a great tree of peace. We're replanting. And you advised us in 1744 to make a nation like yours, and we are now taking your advice. 1775. And what our leaders said, where's your women? Not long ago, President Obama was making a statement at the UN and he said that the United States was the first constituted government, democratic government in the world. We said, not so fast. <laughs> not so fast. I don't think that you really became a democracy until the women could vote in 1920. And what a fight that was. It's still fighting. Still fighting. You know, in this day and age when we need that partnership of men and women together for the common good, we shouldn't be having to waste that energy in that direction. And talk about fighting around the world. Nations have to lay down their guns. They have to lay down their arms and get on to the business of peace. Peace is, is dynamic. Peace is not passive. You have to work hard for peace. You have to work every day for peace. If you stop, the negative power just puts you right back. You lose two steps by standing still. So it requires constant energy, and it requires dedication. 
And in spite of all of the problems that we have in uh, Indigenous America, Native America, America, that's a misnomer too. Comes from Amerigo Vespucci, he was Italian. You know, all of these things you don't think about, but they're all, uh, they're all part of the history. Today in Washington, D.C., at the Museum of the American Indian is an amazing uh, uh, exhibit that you should try and go and see. It's about the treaties. And sitting there prominent is the 1794 treaty with the Haudenosaunee, with the Six Nations, signed by George Washington, signed by your first president. You know, he made a wampum belt to go with that. That's how important our style of thinking was at that time. Your leaders were making wampum belts. Did you know that? Of course not. Of course not. But go down there and see those belts. He made that belt. We have the original belt. We have it. And we use it. Just this past week, we had a Six Nation meeting, and those belts were laying out there for our people to see. They're alive. They're real. And they hold great, great principle, peace. That's the foundation of the Confederacy. Peace, equity, fairness to the people, and union. The power to be united, good minds. And we use the word good minds very advisedly. Good minds, united. Very powerful. That was the basis for your union. It was old for us. Our nations are well over a thousand years old. And just uh, speaking to that point, uh, right now at Onondaga, we've got 13 countries gathered for the International World Championships of Indoor Lacrosse. Amazing countries. Serbia's there. Turkey's there. Israel's got a team. England's there. U.S., hey, your team is there. U.S. is there, and they're going to be tough. They're, you know, and Turkey, just starting, just starting. We were, last night I was watching a workout, and I said, those boys are going to take a thumping. <laughs> <laughs> but they were there. I saw their spirit, and it was most amazing was that our boys were with them. They were trying to help them. We're working hard with them. So it's, good. it's a good event. It's a major event. It's an international competition. And flags will be flying and teams will be vying. And, and the theme of the event is world peace, friendship. We think that needs to be emphasized. That needs to be your, your goal, the goal of this panel, the goal for our future, all of that. And, and recognizing the wellspring, the wellspring of democracy. Democracy didn't come over on the Nina, the Pinta, or the Santa Maria. No, no, no. As a matter of fact, we're trying to get a meeting with the Pope right now for him to rescind the doctrine of discovery. <laughs> okay. And people said, oh, that's so old. Well, yeah, you might say so, but at the Oneida land, land rights action that was taken in 2005, Supreme Court Justice Ginsburg quoted the doctrine of discovery, which says, essentially, and here's what the papal bull, 1493, Alexander VI, Pope, he said, if there are no Christian nations in these new lands that you have discovered, I declare those lands to be empty. Further, if there are people there and they are not Christian, they do not have a right of title to land. 1493. And we've been struggling with that ever since. When we went to Geneva in 1977, I wondered why we had to to make a new law for ourselves called the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. Aren't we people? Don't we have rights? 
took me a long time to find out about the doctrine. No, we're not people. Not in a complete sense, we're told. I said, oh, really? And so finally, 2007, the United Nations adopted the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. It was over a 30-year fight that I was engaged in, our nations were engaged in. Many, many of those leaders went home and were shot and killed. Today, now, so here we are, worried about seven generations and dealing with very, very serious problems at home. You know, this is a racist country, has been for a long time. And you're having problems with that right now. You got a front runner in the GOP who's doing some dangerous, dangerous stirring. That, that's not good stuff that he's stirring up there. Not good. Pushing the wrong buttons, but getting a strong reaction. So, that yeah, we should have a different new president. Else has been there and done that. God damn, leave me alone. <laughs> but he's a good man, and, he, and uh, they stole that one. They stole that one. <laughs> there was no doubt about that. Anyway, I just want to, to emphasize here the, the reason for this seminar, the reason that these men have come here and gathered the reason why you're here is very serious. And uh, it's to the credit, you know, of uh, the union here, the seminary, to host this and promote this since they're part of the problem. And Christianity is part of the problem, and you got to deal with it, face it. And when you do that, then you move on to the next step. You can't move on to the next step if you're dragging baggage. It's just fundamental. So for common cause and for the future and for your children and everybody's children. You know, in the cosmology of, of the Haudenosaunee, our cosmology talks about this game of lacrosse being played on the other side of the stars while this land was still covered with water. That's how long we've been playing this game. We don't call it a sport. It's not a sport. It's a game. And there's whole histories of it. And People have picked it up. When the Iroquois Nationals joined the Federation of International Cross in 1987, there were five teams, United States, Canada, Australia, England, and the Iroquois. In Denver, the World Games last year, 153 teams, 153 countries. That's a lot of people in a short time. And they love the game. It's a good game. But it is much more than a game. You know, it's a spirit of, of friendship. It's a spirit of goodwill. We use it for medicine. We use it to, to help our people. There's process for all that. And so the issues that we face today, the common cause, the environment, Called there, but we're the environment, you know. You're not separate from that. You've heard it again. People know it. We say it. Do we believe it? Do we understand it? How you're dependent, totally dependent on the earth. Totally. And if you don't take care of that, you suffer the consequence. People talk about, you know, they said, oh, you'll save the world. Are you kidding? We are going to save the world. The world's not going anywhere. The world's going to be here for a long, long time. It'll regenerate. It's got great regenerative powers. It's us that may not be here. It's our choice. It's our choice. It's in our hands. It's up to us. And we're the ones going to determine. I think this generation right here and the next one will determine whether our species will survive. So you better get with it, you better understand it, and uh, the quaint practices of indigenous people, which are these 
ceremonies and at these rituals is how we teach our children to respect the earth. Those are Thanksgivings, and we have them around the clock, around the lunar clock. We're having one Thanksgiving after the other, appreciation for life, understanding how dependent we are and our responsible our responsibility to ourselves in the future. So I'm so anxious to hear the next panelists and what they're going to direct us and how they're going to help us uh, find our way through this. But remember, the Hoodie stance is your ally. We are here, we've always been here, and we're not going anywhere. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being well and thank you for thank you for teaching us and showing us and being so patient with us all these years, Chief Lyons. I'm very honored by your presence. <clears throat> Our next speaker is a former Divinity School student, Vanderbilt School of Religion. He grew up between Tennessee and Washington, D.C. I thought I might tell you a little bit about the things in his life that he, that he likes to talk about. Uh, he grew up in Tennessee working with livestock, working with tobacco, being in the river, being in the soil, um, being in the one-room uh, churches of that community there. And then also in Washington, D.C., around the Capitol, where his father was serving from 1938 to 1970 in very tumultuous times. In, on February 7, 1964, he attended the first Beatles concert in 